Today we're going to be talking about uh, Taweed. Uh, what's your understanding of what Taweed is, first of all? Well, as I understand it, um, the traditional Muslim belief is that Tawheed is the fundamental theological principle of Islam and it is that God is one and indivisible, that he cannot be divided. And Muslims, uh, in my, my experience, uh, are completely condemning of Christianity for the belief in the Holy Trinity, saying, no, in Islam there's only one God and he only exists in one part. He can't be divided into parts. And it's probably taught by Muslims as their original contribution to the world of religions, that they've come up with this. It's original. Uh, they, they own the concept. They own the word. You know. Well, what we're going to talk about today is actually the origin of the concept, the formula that's often used in the Shahada, and also where the actual word Tawheed comes from. So uh, that's what we're going to look at. So uh, after a bit of digging, um, what I found was there's a guy called Shlomo Pines, and he did a bit of research into this. And what he found was that there's an earlier version of this in pseudo Clementines homilies in Greek. Um, so, like in the Arabic, you have La ila ila Allah or La ila ila Hua, whereas in the Greek you have Hes esten ho theos ke plen oto uk esten. And easy for you to say. Easy for me to say, it's all Greek to me. But what that actually means in English is God is one, there is no God except Him. So we have that from the 4th century, it was dated to between 300 and 320 AD. And this would have been um, available to people living in Syria, which would suggest that this formula was translated into Arabic and, and was probably a common formula that was used over the centuries. Um, and essentially, this book was a romance. It's a, book, it's a work of fiction. And so essentially... Sorry, wait, wait, which book is this? This is uh, with the, the collection of homilies no, known as Pseudo Clementine. Okay. Um, so this is equivalent to Harry Potter. And yet the Quran is basing its central um, principle on this formula. It's, it would be like me uh, quoting from Harry Potter and saying, OK, this is my scripture. I got it from... Um, from the angel Gabriel, but actually someone comes along and says, well, actually, I, I, I've noticed you, you got this from this particular book. Yeah. But you got something even, in, in my view, even more interesting, uh, which is the origin of the word Tawheed. Could you talk to us about that? Yeah, just um, firstly, um, the idea that there is only one God, monotheism, is not, of course, original to, to Islam, is quite, quite common. And the Bible says many times that there's, there's only one God. That's the fundamental principle behind the Bible, and the Quran adopts that. What I find interesting is the view that um, the... Is, I'm sorry, I'm momentarily distracted there. Is the view that uh, God is indivisible, that he can't have any parts, that he is uh, a unicity. And it seems to me that there's no evidence in the Quran for this statement. There's that lots of evidence to say that there's only one God, but it never says that he cannot be divided. And on many occasions, the Quran does actually refer to God as being a very, very complex entity with many moving parts. So the Quran talks about, um, it uses uh, anthropomorphic language to talk about God's body. It talks about the eye of God, or God doing things with his hands, like making uh, cattle with his hands, or making Adam with his hands. It talks about uh, people prostrating to God's shin. Um, it has God speaking, which implies that God has a mouth. It talks about God's face, which the mouth will obviously be part of. Um, it talks about God sitting on a throne, which again suggests that he's got um, a, a, a torso and buttocks. So uh, time and time again, the Quran explicitly says that God has parts. And this seems to be so emphasized and so frequent that it that it, it seems to me that the Quran author does actually imagine God as having a body with various parts that can be identified. Secondly, it talks about the spirit of God in various different contexts. It talks about the spirit of the command coming down with the angels in Surah 97. Well, we know that the spirit of the command isn't an angel because he comes down with the angels. And, and it seems to be the spirit of God. When 
um, at, at the point of the immaculate, uh, not the immaculate conception, at the point of the conception of Jesus, um, uh, it uh, so uh, three, I think it is, uh, states that God took the form of a perfect man and then breathed his spirit into Jesus. So um, this is a very complex idea of God. It's not, it's not a single, unitary, indivisible point. If God is taking a form and then is breathing his spirit into another person, then presumably Jesus has the body of, or has something of God within him, um, just as Adam has the spirit of God breathed into him. And little, little footnote, if I can just go off on a very brief digression, uh, I would say that explains why the angels venerate Adam. It's not because Adam has any um, divine qualities of himself. It's not because Adam is the work of God, because we're all the work of God. It is because Adam has God's spirit breathed into him, and that is why the angels uh, prostrate to him. So it's a very, very complex idea of God. It is not one single point. And the third and final point, very brief one, is in Surah 24, the Quran explicitly has a, a multivariate vision of God. The Quran talks about God as being a lamp in a niche, but then goes to talk about the elements in the lamp. It talks about three parts, the glass, the wick with the flame, and the oil. And, uh, and it seems to me that the image of a lamp comprising three parts could very easily have been a metaphor for the Holy Trinity. At the very least, it's, it's a complex idea. It's not a simple idea. I would suggest that the, that, that analogy is probably from St. Ephraim, who writes many, many different hymns, all using symbols mm -hmm. for God. Um, and there is one on light. There's, there are hymns on the Trinity. There's, uh, there's hymns on Mary. You know, there's tons of these. And, and what's interesting is many of the words in the Quran have got a Syriac connection. So it is possible that St. Ephraim may be the origin of a lot of these uh, metaphors. But in terms of the word Tawheed itself, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's, that's the real um, well, money, money uh, <laughs> point that we'd like to kind of bring away today with. Well, the, the word Tawheed, as far as I know, doesn't appear in the Quran it's, itself. But it's oft, so often used uh, in relation to Islam, in relation to the teachings of the Quran, I mean, I find, I, I form a connection with the Ethiopian Tawahedo Church. Now, this Just is part... that word again? The Tawahedo. So the Orthodox, the um, Oriental Orthodox Church of Ethiopia, um, then, as now, is called the Tawahedo Church. And, and there, it means one, and the word Tawahedo seems to mean one or unified, um, but there it, they took that name because it's a monophysite church. It believes in the one nature of the, the Jesus has his humanity and his divinity incorporated within one nature, uh, which is opposed to the Chalcedonian belief, which is that God has, uh, that Jesus has two natures um, that are uh, both exist. Um, in the one person. Yes, uh, uh, concurrently. So um, there is there a connection between um, the Quran and Ethiopia? Well, very much so. You mentioned that there is, um, that they mentioned that there is uh, um, a lot of Syriac vocabulary in the Quran. Yeah. Well, the, there's also some Ethiopian vocabulary in the Quran, but the Ethiopian vocabulary seems to come in. There's no, it's almost completely missing from the early short surahs and seems to only make an appearance in the later, longer surahs. So, and when the Ethiopian language does come in, um, it seems to have a very Christian connection. So you have words like Maida, meaning the table, which is a, a Christian image in Surah 5 for uh, the Last Supper and the Eucharist. And just on that, that word first appeared in the Ethiopian Bible in the 6th mm. century. So it looks like it came directly, though there are other routes in which it could have come into the common parlance. The other word, which is very unusual, is the word shaitan instead of the word Satan, which would be the common word that would have been used in most Syriac areas, um, Israel, Transjordan. But it's, it's unusual that they've gone for a version of that word, which is more commonly found in Ethiopia or perhaps Yemen. So it's, that kind of in itself suggests that there is a connection with the south, with Ethiopia, with Yemen, and also with the north, which might suggests that there are a group of different people writing the Quran or perhaps there was 
a transition from location to location uh, over the course of the the Quranic material. Yeah. A, c- a couple of other examples uh, is the word Injil, which uh, the Quran uses the word Injil in the singular for the gospel. Um, but this, uh, the experts say, looks as though it's come from the Ethiopian Wangel, which is, uh, it doesn't sound very, uh, very Greek. Uh, it doesn't sound like it comes from the Greek root, which of course um, the evangel- evangelist uh, is, a, is a Greek term. Um, but it seems like it's come via the Ethiopian. And another example, it refers to the apostles uh, of Jesus as being Hawaria, which, uh, which is, a, again, an Ethiopian word. So it looks as though at some stage during the course of the coming into existence of the Quran, uh, the, the, the author started to adopt Ethiopic language, particularly in relation to Christian themes. And my suspicion is that the word Tawhid um, is derived from the Tawahedo Church of Ethiopia.